A Backwoods Boy by Russell Friedman. Quote, it is a great piece of folly to attempt to make anything out of my early life. It can all be condensed into a simple sentence, and that sentence you will find in Gray's Elegy. Quote, the short and simple annals of the poor. Quote, that's my life, and that's all you or anyone else can make of it. End quote. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln never liked to talk much about his early life. A poor, black, a poor backwoods farm boy, he grew up swinging an axe on frontier homesteads in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. He was born near Hoganfield, or Hodgenfield, Kentucky, on February 12, 1809, in a log cabin with one window, one door, a chimney, and a hard-packed dirt floor. His parents named him after his pioneer grandfather. The first Abraham Lincoln had been shot dead by hostile Indians in 1786 while planting a field of corn in the Kentucky wilderness. Young Abraham was still a toddler when his family packed their belongings and moved to another log cabin farm a few miles north on Knob Creek. That was the first home he could remember, the place where he ran and played as a barefoot boy. He remembered the bright waters of Knob Creek as it tumbled past the Lincoln Log and disappeared into the Kentucky Hills. Once he fell into the rushing creek and almost drowned before he was pulled out by a neighbor boy. Another time, he caught a fish and gave it to a passing soldier. Lincoln never forgot the names of his first teachers. Zachariah Riney, followed by Caleb Hazel, who ran a windowless log schoolhouse two miles away. It was called a blab school. Pupils of all ages sat on rough wooden benches and bawled out their lessons aloud. Abraham went there with his sister Sarah, who was two years older, when they could be spared from their chores at home. Holding hands, they would walk through scrub trees and across creek bottoms to the schoolhouse door. They learned their numbers from one to ten and a smattering of reading, writing, and spelling. Their parents couldn't read or write at all. Abraham's mother, Nancy, signed her name by making a shakily drawn mark. He would remember her as a thin, sad-eyed woman who labored beside her husband in the fields. She liked to gather the children around her in the evening to recite prayers and Bible stories she had memorized. His father, Thomas, was a burly, barrel-chested farmer and carpenter who had worked hard at homesteading since marrying Nancy Hanks in 1806. A sociable fellow, his greatest pleasure was to crack jokes and swap stories with his chums. With painful effort, Thomas Lincoln could scrawl his name. Like his wife, he had grown up without education, but that wasn't unusual in those days. He supported his family by living off his own land, and he watched for a chance to better himself. In 1816, Thomas decided to pull up stakes again and move north to Indiana, which was about to join the Union as the nation's 19th state. Abraham was seven. He remembered the 100-mile journey as the hardest experience of his life. The family set out on a cold morning in December, loading all their possessions on two horses. They crossed the Ohio River on a makeshift ferry, traveled through towering forest, then hacked a path through tangled underbrush until they reached their new home site near the backwoods community of Little Pigeon Creek. Thomas put up a temporary winter, winter shelter, a crude, three-sided lean-to of logs and branches. At the open end, he kept a fire burning to take off the edge of the cold and to scare off the wild animals. At night, wrapped in bearskins and huddled by the fire, 
Abraham and Sarah listened to wolves howl and panthers scream. Abraham passed his eighth birthday in the lean-to. He was big for his age, a tall spider of a boy, and old enough to handle an ox. And old enough to handle an axe. He helped his father clear the land. They planted corn and pumpkin seeds between the tree stumps, and they built a new log cabin, the biggest one yet, where Abraham climbed a ladder and slept in a loft beneath the roof. Soon after the cabin was finished, some of Nancy's kinfolk arrived. Her aunt and uncle, with their adopted son Dennis, had decided to follow the Lincolns to Indiana. Dennis Hanks became an extra hand to Thomas and a big brother to Abraham, someone to run and wrestle with. A year later, Nancy's aunt and uncle lay dead, victims of the dreaded milk sickness. Milk sickness, now known to be caused by a poisonous plant with white snake root, called white snake root. An epidemic of the disease swept through the Indiana woods in the summer of 1818. Nancy had nursed her relatives until the end, and then she too came down with the disease. Abraham watched his mother toss in bed with chills, fever, and pain for seven days before she died at the age of 34. She knew she was going to die, Dennis Hanks recalled. She called up the children to her dying side and told them to be good and kind to their father, to one another, and to the world. Thomas built a coffin from black cherry wood, and nine-year-old Abraham whittled the pegs that held the wooden planks together. They buried Nancy on a windswept hill next to her aunt and uncle. Sarah, now eleven, took her mother's place, cooking, cleaning, and mending clothes for her father, brother, and and cousin Dennis in the forlorn and lonely cabin. Thomas Lincoln waited for a year. Then he went back to Kentucky to find himself a new wife. He returned in a four-horse wagon with a woman named, with a widow named Sarah Bush Johnson, her three children, and all her household goods. Abraham and his sister were fortunate, for their stepmother was a warm and loving person. She took the motherless children to her heart and raised them as her own. She also spruced up the neglected Lincoln cabin, now shared by eight people who lived, ate, and slept in a single smoky room with a loft. Abraham was growing fast, shooting up like a sunflower, a spindly youngster with big bony hands, unruly black hair, a dark complexion and luminous gray eyes. He became an expert with the axe, working alongside his father, who also hired him to work for others. For 25 cents a day, the the boy dug wells, built pigeons, split fence rails, felled trees. My, how he could chop, exclaimed a friend. His axe would flash and bite into a sugar tree or a sycamore, and down it would come. If you heard him felling trees in a clearing, you would say that there were three men at work the way the trees fell. Meanwhile, he went to school by littles, in quotes. He went to school by littles. A few weeks, one winter, maybe a month the next Lincoln said later that all his schooling together, quote, did not amount to one year. Some fragments of his schoolwork still survive, including a verse that he wrote in his homemade arithmetic book, quote, Abraham Lincoln, the hand and pen, he will be good, but God knows when. Mostly he educated himself by borrowing books and newspapers. There are many stories about Lincoln's efforts to find enough books to satisfy him in that backwoods country. Those he liked to read again and again, losing himself in the adventures of Robinson Crusoe or the magical tales of the Arabian Nights. He was thrilled by 
the, a biography of George Washington with its str- stirring account of the Revolutionary War. And he came to love the rhyme and rhythm of poetry, reciting passages from Shakespeare or the Scottish poet Robert Burns at the drop of a hat. He would carry a book out to the field with him so he could read at the end of each plow furrow while the horse was getting its breath. When noon came, he would sit under a tree and read while he ate. I never saw Abe after he was 12 that he didn't have a book in his hand or in his pocket, Dennis Hanks remembered. It didn't seem natural to see a feller read like that. By the time he was 16, Abraham was six feet tall. The gangliest, awkwardest feller. He appeared to be all joints, said a neighbor. He may have looked awkward, but hard physical labor had given him a tough, lean body with muscular arms like steel cables. He could grab a woodsman's axe by the handle and hold it straight out at arm's length. And he was one of the best wrestlers and runners around. He also had a reputation as a comic and storyteller. Like his father, Abraham was fond of talking and listening to talk. About this time, he had found a book called Lessons in Elocution, which offered advice on public speaking. He practiced before his friends, standing on a tree stump as he entertained them with fiery imitations of the roving preachers and politicians who often visited Little Pigeon Creek. Folks liked young Lincoln. They regarded him as good-humored, easygoing boy, a bookworm maybe, but smart and willing to oblige. Yet even then, people noticed that he could be moody and withdrawn. As a friend put it, he was witty, sad, and reflective by turns. At the age of 17, Abraham left home for a few months to work as a ferryman's helper on the Ohio River. He was 18 when his sister Sarah died early in 1828 while giving birth to her first child. That spring, Abraham had a chance to get away from the backwoods and see something of the, of the world. A local merchant named James Gentry hired Lincoln to accompany his son Alan on a 1,200-mile flatboat voyage to New Orleans. With their cargo of country produce, the two boys floated down the Ohio River and into the Mississippi, maneuvering with long poles to avoid snags and sandbars and to navigate in the busy river traffic. New Orleans was the first real city they had ever seen. Their eyes must have popped as the great harbor came into view, jammed with the mast of sailing ships from distant ports all over the world. The city's cobblestone streets teemed with sailors, traders, and adventurers speaking strange languages. And there were gangs of slaves everywhere. Lincoln would never forget the sight of black men, women, and children being driven along on, in chains and auctioned off like cattle. In those days, New Orleans had more than 200 slave dealers. The boys sold their cargo and their flatboat and returned upriver by steamboat. Abraham earned $24, a good bit of money at the time, for a three-month trip. He handed the money over to his father according to law and custom. Thomas Lincoln was thinking about moving on again. Lately, he had heard glowing reports about Illinois, where instead of forests, there were endless prairies with plenty of rich black soil. Early in 1830, Thomas sold his Indiana farm. The Lincolns piled everything they owned into two ox-drawn wagons and set out over muddy roads with Abraham, just turned 21, driving one of the wagons himself. They traveled west to their new home site in central Illinois, not far from Decatur. Once again, Abraham helped his father build a cabin and start a new farm. He stayed with his family through their first prairie winter, but he was getting restless. 
he had met an enterprising fellow named Denton Offutt, who wanted him to take another boatload of cargo down the river to New Orleans. Abraham agreed to make the trip with his stepbrother, John Johnson, and a cousin, John Hanks. When he returned to Illinois three months later, he paid a quick farewell visit to his father and stepmother. Abraham was 22 now, of legal age, free to do what he wanted. His parents were settled and could get along without him. Denton Offutt was planning to open a general store in the flourishing village of New Salem, Illinois, and he had promised Lincoln a steady job. Lincoln arrived in New Salem in July 1831, wearing a faded cotton shirt and blue jeans too short for his long legs. A friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, as he later described himself. He tended the counter at Denton off its store and slept in a room at the back. The village stood in a wooden grove on a bluff above the Sangamon River. Founded just two years earlier, it had about 100 people living in one and two room log houses. Cattle grazed behind split rail fences, hogs snuffled along dusty lanes, and chickens and geese flapped about underfoot. New Salem was still a small place, but it was growing. The settlers expected it to become a frontier boom town. With his gifts for swapping stories and making friends, Lincoln fit easily into the life of the village. He showed off his skill with an axe, competed in foot races, and got along with everyone from Minter Graham, the schoolmaster, to Jack Armstrong, the leader of a rowdy gang called the Clary's Groves Boys. Armstrong was the wrestling champion of New Salem. He quickly challenged Lincoln to a match. On the appointed day, an excited crowd gathered down by the river, placing bets as the wrestlers stripped to the waist for combat. They circled each other and came to grips, twisting and tugging until they crashed to the ground with Lincoln on top. As he pinned Armstrong's shoulders to the ground, the other Clary's Grove boys dived in to join the scuffle. Lincoln broke away, backed against a cliff, and defiantly or offered to take them all on, one at a time. Impressed, Armstrong jumped to his feet and offered Lincoln his hand, declaring the match a draw. After that, they were fast friends. Lincoln also found a place among the town's intellectuals. He joined the New Salem Debating Society, which met once a week in James Rutledge's tavern. The first time he debated, he seemed nervous. But as he began to speak in his high, reedy voice, he surprised everyone with the force and logic of his argument. He was already a fine speaker, one debater recalled. All he lacked was culture. Lincoln was self-conscious about his meager education and ambitious to improve himself. Graham Mentor, Mentor Graham, the schoolmaster, and a fellow debater took a liking to the young man lent him books, and offered to coach him in the fine points of English grammar. Lincoln had plenty of time to study. There wasn't much business at Alfred's store, so he could spend long hours reading as he sat behind the counter. When the store failed in 1832, Alfred moved on to other schemes. Lincoln had to find something else to do. At the age of 23, he decided to run for the Illinois State Legislature. Why not? He knew everyone in town, people liked him, and he was rapidly gaining confidence as a public speaker. His friends urged him to run, saying that a bright young man could go far in politics. So Lincoln announced his candidacy and his political platform. He was in favor of local improvements, like better roads and canals. canals. He had made a study of the Sangamon, Sangamon River, he had made a study of the Sangamon River, and he proposed that it would be that it be dredged and cleared so steamboats could call at New Salem, ensuring a glorious future for the town. Before he could start his campaign, an Indian war flared up in northern Illinois. Chief Black Hawk 
of the Salk and Fox tribes had crossed the Mississippi, intending, he said, to raise corn on land that had been taken from his people 30 years earlier. The white settlers were alarmed, and the governor called for volunteers to stop the invasion. Lincoln enlisted in a militia company made up of his friends and neighbors. He was surprised and pleased when the men elected him as their captain and Jack Armstrong as first sergeant. His troops drilled and marched, but they never did sight any hostile Indians. Years later, Lincoln would joke about his three-month stint as a military man, telling how he survived as a good many bloody battles with mosquitoes. He survived a good many bloody battles with mosquitoes. By the time he returned to New Salem, election day was just two weeks off. He jumped into the campaign, pitching horseshoes with voters, speaking at barbecues, chatting with farmers in the fields, joking with customers at country stores. He lost, finishing eighth in a field of of 13. But in his own precinct, where folks knew him, he received 227 out of the 300 votes cast. Defeated as a politician, he decided to try his luck as a frontier merchant. With a fellow named William Barry as his partner, Lincoln operated a general store that sold everything from axes to beeswax. But the two men showed little aptitude for business, and their store finally winked out, as Lincoln put it. Then Barry died, leaving Lincoln saddled with a $1,100 debt, a gigantic amount for someone who had never earned more than a few dollars a month. Lincoln called it the national debt, but he vowed to repay every cent. He spent the next 15 years doing so. To support himself, he worked at all sorts of odd jobs. He split, rinse, he split fence rails, hired himself out as a farmhand, helped at the local grist mill. With the help of friends, he was appointed postmaster of New Salem, a part-time job that paid about $50 a year. Then he was offered a chance to become deputy to the local surveyor. He knew nothing about surveying, so he bought a compass, a chain, and a couple of textbooks on the subject. Within six weeks, he had taught himself enough to start work, laying out roads and town sites and marking off property boundaries. As he traveled about the county, making surveys and delivering mail to faraway farms, people came to know him as an honest and dependable fellow. Lincoln could be counted on to witness a contract, settle a boundary dispute, or compose a letter for folks who couldn't write much themselves. For the first time, his neighbors began to call him Abe. In 1834, Lincoln ran for the state legislature again. This time, he placed second in a field of 13 candidates and was one of four men elected to the Illinois House of Representatives from Saginaw County. In November, wearing a $60 tailor-made suit he had bought on credit, the first suit he had ever owned, the 25-year-old legislator climbed into a stagecoach and set out for the state capitol in Vandalia. In those days, Illinois lawmakers were paid $3 a day to cover their expenses, but only while the legislature was in session. Lincoln still had to earn a living. One of his fellow representatives, a rising young attorney named John Todd Stewart, urged Lincoln to take up the study of law. As Stewart pointed out, it was an ideal profession for anyone with political ambitions. And in fact, Lincoln had been toying with the idea of becoming a lawyer. For years, he had hung around frontier courthouses, watching country lawyers bluster bluster, and strut as they cross-examined witnesses and delivered impassioned speeches before juries. He had sat on juries himself, appeared as a witness, drawn up legal documents for his neighbors. He had even argued a few cases before the local justice of the peace. Yes, the law intrigued him. It would give him a chance to rise in the world, to earn a respected place in the community, to live by his wits instead of by hard physical labor. Yet Lincoln hesitated, unsure of himself because he had so little formal formal education. 
That was no great obstacle, his friend Stuart kept telling him. In the 1830s, few American lawyers had ever seen the inside of a law school. Instead, they read law in the office of a practicing attorney until they knew enough to pass their exams. Lincoln decided to study entirely on his own. He borrowed some law books from Stewart, bought others at an auction, and began to read and memorize legal codes and precedents. Back in New Salem, folks would see him walking down the road, reciting aloud from one of his law books, or lying under a tree as he read, his long legs stretched up the trunk. He studied for nearly three years before passing his exams and being admitted to practice on March 1, 1837. By then, the state legislature was planning to move from um, Vandalia to Springfield, which had been named the new capital of Illinois. Lincoln had been elected to a second term in the legislature, and he had accepted a job as junior partner in John Todd Stewart's Springfield Law Office. In April, he went to New Salem for the last time to pack his belongings and say goodbye to his friends. The little village was declining now. Its hopes for growth and prosperity had vanished when the Saginaw River proved too treacherous for steamboat travel. Settlers were moving away, seeking brighter prospects elsewhere. By 1840, New Salem was a ghost town. It would have been completely forgotten forgotten completely if Abraham Lincoln hadn't gone there to live when he was a young, when he was young, penniless, and ambitious. And this is written by Russell Friedman.